I'm Toya Nash Randall, curator and catalyst of the multimedia narrative platform Voice Vision Value. And I'm excited to announce my newest partnership with nationally respected philanthropist, community leader, and entrepreneur, Shonda Smith Baker. Sponsored by Voice Vision Value, Centering Conversations is a new exclusive segment of the award-winning podcast, Conversations with Shonda. If you want to know more about Voice Vision Value, check us out at voicevisionvalue.org, where you can also read the Twin Cities chapter of the forthcoming book, Portraits of Us. This is Centering Conversation, powered by Voice Vision Value, an exclusive of Conversations with Shonda. I'm here today with Erica Seth Davies. Erica, if you would, could you just give us an introduction of who you are? I'm Shonda. It's a pleasure to meet you and it's a pleasure to be here. I am an appreciative of the work of Voice Vision Value as well. So I'm Erica Seth Davies. I use she, her pronouns. Um, professionally, I am the CEO of Reaventures and also the founder of the Racial Equity Asset Lab. I am Rosalind and Juan Seth's daughter. I am Alexis Seth's sister. I am Ethan and Evelyn's mother. <laughs> um, so those are some of the roles that I that I occupy in my life. I am also a friend to many, colleague to even more. And I am an advocate. I'm a weaver in the social change ecosystem. And I am trying to be a good ancestor to future generations. I can appreciate all of that. And I think, you know, we jumped on um, before we we started and we were talking a little bit about, I don't know if they're necessarily competing priorities, but all of the priorities that we manage in our lives. And I know that we are not the only busy people, productive people, but there is something around the way in which we're working that has us with multiple hats on. How are you managing those multiple hats? Like, we need to hear the the real of what that's like, because I think often we gloss over and make it look pretty. Yes. Um, when you said, how are you managing? My, my immediate response was, am I? I don't know. I don't know that I am. I get things done, but it does happen at a cost. And I think the, the cost is uh, really time for myself and my ability to have spaciousness. That's the word that I used uh, a little bit earlier, just to reflect (laughs) and to plan thoughtfully about the things that I I want to do, uh, whether it is professionally or personally. So I think there's just a lot of movement, a lot of doing, a lot of um, multitasking. Although folks say that that's not really a thing. You're just switching from one thing to another uh, very quickly. So I think that's how we manage, or at least how I manage at this point. So if my, as happened today, a daughter who is home, I'm traveling, um, you know, tells my sister, I don't want to go to school. I don't feel well. And I have to intervene and have a conversation and find out what's going on and realize, oh, I think you have the flu, right? Like everything else had to stop so I could get through that. And then you go back into okay, what's happening in my day-to-day? What's the next place that I need to be? What's the next call that I need to have? So for me, the the priority is always and will always be my children. And so that's a very clarifying uh, idea. So I know when I need to pause, regardless of what else is going on, that's the thing that will stop everything is when, when they are, uh, when they need me. And then we just manage. We just, <laughs> we just manage uh, all all the other things that that go on, and I think I'm I'm getting to a point now also of using more nose and delegating more and expecting others to to step up. So so parenting while being an executive is more <laughs> than a notion. So I have I have five kids and a stepdaughter. So my youngest just turned eighteen. So I feel like I'm on I'm on the other side of what was uh really looking back. I can't believe I was able to juggle all yeah. of the texts that came through the day, all of the needs, the mom I forgot, mom I need, yes. mom can you take? <laughs> mom, mom, can you mom cannot <laughs> right all of the all the things that that come in. And yes. trying to be, you know, have have my, um, what they say, be present where your feet are. 
right? Like it was oh. very hard to do that when you have these these people over here that require your attention. And I know there's mm-hmm. lots of of parents and and folks caring for children that are listening um, to that. And and do you think that the workplace um, is getting more accepting to those of us that are parenting? Um, yes and no. So I think yes, as more, quite frankly, women find themselves in leadership positions and we can lead from a place of lived experience. I know for me, that's that's true um, as a CEO and having the authority uh, to be able to set certain conditions, policies, culture in my organization that emerged from my own experience. One, as a a mother um, of young children who worked remotely um, for about seven years during critical moments, uh, how beneficial that was. And so when I had the opportunity to create the conditions in my own organization, those were the things that were front of mind for me, right? How do I make this work for um, for anyone in the organization, but as a an organization focused on reproductive and maternal health equity, how do I make this work in particular uh, for women and other birthing people? I could do that, and I think we we have done that. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Nothing is. But there are decisions, very intentional decisions that I made to ensure that people could be successful in balancing um, their lives, balancing parenthood, parent balancing motherhood, um, you know, for some of our, our team who have had um, had babies in staying on the team um, and making sure, again, our policies and our practices are reflective of that commitment. And the vein that more people are taking on positions where they can actually do these things, yes. Um, is it widespread? No. And it's not embedded in policy, right, in public policy. So we still have a very long way to go. Uh, with respect to changing conditions uh, for for people to thrive um, in, in these ways as parents, as mothers in the workplace. I was recalling a, a story with someone yesterday, and I said that when I first came into the work, I was single parenting of three of those kids and actually did not share with my employer that I had those kids because oh, wow. I knew the limits that would be placed on me. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was even worried in the interview process or around that that time coming in that I would be judged or you can't possibly do these things because yeah. you've got these kids. And so I intentionally didn't even talk about about them. And that's heartbreaking to hear. Right. So to know that that was a decision that that you had to make um, just to have an opportunity to take care of yourself and your family um, and in a job and in the workforce. And, you know, I remember when I worked at an organization, it's actually an organization where I met Toya Randall, um, founder of Voice Vision Values. Um, but when I worked at AFI, it was remote and we had conferences and other types of events. That whole community of people know my children because they were with me all the time. They were at conferences, you know, kind of sitting in the back of the room or sitting at the registration table or kind of coming through the, the lobby to have dinner. Right? So I, like that's what I had to do. And I never thought about doing otherwise. But that was the environment that I was working in also, that it was one um, that was supportive in that way. And so to have even a, uh, that you felt like you had to do that. Again, it's just, that's just devastating because you can't then function fully, right? So we try to now, you know, kind of create these environments where people don't feel like they are less of a worker because they have to leave at two o'clock to go to a parent-teacher conference or to, you know, take a kid to the doctor or whatever. These are the things of life and and work should be able to accommodate that. Yeah, I think that's right. And you've done a lot of work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Mm-hmm. You know, often in the social sector, at least I have heard that organizations that are serving communities of color or diverse com- communities often feel like they're on the forefront of that work. Yet at the same time, their diverse staff sometimes feel distance from um, feeling as though they feel as they're not feeling as included. They feel like they're not walking their talk in terms of the organization. Do you think our sector, the social sector, philanthropy, the nonprofits, are we doing enough to really attack 
diversity, equity, and inclusion in our space? Nope. <laughs> Simple answer, no. Um, you know, there was the the flashpoint, the moment of reckoning um, uh, with George Floyd's murder in 2020. And it had a lot of discussion about it, um, but very few organizations knew, I believe, how to operationalize their values or their principles for, um, for equity. So a lot of the focus was on the interpersonal dynamics, right, implicit bias, um, and culture, um, but not necessarily policy and practice that wraps around that as well. So um, the idea of understanding root cause, right, like understanding who dominates uh, philanthropy and who has dominated the nonprofit sector, very often didn't come into play. I'll give you an example. Um, a friend reached out to me because she sat on the board of an organization um, that provides like scholarships, I think, for for um, uh, black and brown students uh, in Baltimore, in the city. She was concerned because there was a long-term employee who had not had a raise in a very long time. And there was an actual conversation about, well, do we give her a raise or do we continue to do scholarships? Um, because, you know, scholarships are going to lift people out of poverty. It never occurred to people sitting around the table, all of whom were very well employed, very well compensated, um, including the ED, who did not need salary, <laughs> did not need her salary, was collecting one, but it you know, wasn't essential for her, that you were paying someone poverty wages, but you are like, so you have to live this value or this intention or this mission in everything you do. You can't pay poverty wages to your staff and talk about lifting people out of poverty with education. Um, but everybody that was making decisions about resources didn't need the resources of the organization. This person did. Um, and so when we looked at, I said, well, you know, let's take a look at average salary, what it should be in the state of Maryland, in the region, right, for what it is that she does. That's where you need to start. And so once they took a, a, a systems analysis, right, like looked at this as institutional practice reflective of values, they recognized or had to reckon with the fact that this is how racism works. You are serving a Black community. You are a bunch of white people making these decisions who have resources, and you're actually ensuring someone stays in poverty, and you have the power to choose otherwise. You will long have the power to choose otherwise. Um, and so those are the types of things that um, happen in the sector all the time, um, because initially, who was leading charity, right? Like these were charities. And so there was people who didn't necessarily, you know, they, their benevolence, right? Like white saviorism or whatever you want to call it was, you know, you know, what was deciding where resources went, how these things were structured, who got salaries. Like that's why so many of the salaries are depressed because people who were leading them didn't need the money, right? Like it was, it was just in their spare time kind of thing. And so those are sort of the root cause analysis that needs to happen. So we are doing some some work to, to change the expectations and the understanding of how it operates because the level of work and the type of work that's happening in the nonprofit sector that is actually taking on actual gaps that the government is no longer filling needs to be recognized and compensated. Um, it's not that people should want to take a lower salary to do this work. It's still hard work. And the idea that you don't need to get compensated fairly is prices are going up everywhere, right? Like, it's the, you know, forward housing or food or whatever the case may be. So that's my take. Yeah. Do you have... Um, Did I answer the question? Yeah, no, you absolutely <laughs> answered it. And what I was thinking about is um, pay disparities that happen that are gender driven, right? The the pay discrepancy mm -hmm. between women and men, folks of color and white folks. Do you have other examples of how philanthropy should be examining its work around race, inclusion, belonging, justice? I mean, everything from the source of, of the money, right? So uh, what was this, wealth achieved through extraction and exploitation, which in a lot of circumstances it was, um, to what are our practices with respect to data when we give these grants, um, who's getting general operating support, who's getting, you know, restricted funding, uh, what's the size of the grants that are being given out, again, who's getting these resources. So when you look at the leadership of nonprofits, 
Um, is it white led organizations working in communities of color or is it people of color serving their own communities, right? So there's a huge difference between self-determination and, and system change and charity. Um, and so what are you practicing um, really? So charity is like kind of giving a little bit of money and not thinking about um, really what is the, what's the change that we want to see? Every nonprofit should be working to put itself out of business. And so are you actually working and supporting organizations that are doing that, that are trying to move to a different system and eradicating the actual issue that they're working on? Or is it, you know, a lot of charity, right? Like, and if there's, I, a need is so great that I don't want to diminish the, the, uh, how essential it is that we resource direct service. There has to be resource. Um, and <laughs> we have to think long-term and systemically about how do we shift this work overall? Um, so again, yeah, so what's the data telling us and how do we make those shifts? Um, do we understand uh, kind of how this came about and then what does that require of us if we're um, kind of thinking about, again, root cause analysis? What are the stories that philanthropy is telling about who's being served and why? I know, I think a, a colleague, Travian Shorters, that talks about um, uh, framing, narrative framing, right? Like asset framing versus deficit framing. How intentional are we about that? Um, all of these things matter, and then these are things that you know philanthropy can certainly be working on to shift the way that it operates. And I think the the one thing that I would definitely say also about that is um, how all capital is leveraged in that way, right? So the grant making is one thing, but endowment money is an entirely different <laughs> um, set of set of dollars, and the degree to which the, the money is lining up with the mission tells me how committed institutions are. Um, so if you're investing the money that you expect to be returned and, and have growth in that return, if you're investing in something that actually makes your philanthropy necessary, which what, what do you think is going to win? Like you're working at cross purposes <laughs> at that point. Yeah. So um, there's so many things that philanthropy could be, could be doing differently, but you know, we've talked about those in the field for quite some time. Shout out to Trabian and, and Be Me Communities. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Shout out to him and and the work that he's doing around asset framing. And we are in a sector that has learned to talk about communities by its um disparity mm -hmm. language, these poor underinvested children. And so Trabian and others have done wonderful work in terms of thinking about children who have dreams whose communities have been underinvested in because systems have not valued those communities. That mm -hmm. the, the language, in fact, does not disparage the community and the, the people that live there yeah. in the way that we have been accustomed to. And, you know, I, I, can, I often cringe at some of the language that we use. Yes. And I think that's I, part of part of the evolution, right? Of you know, I'm from a neighborhood that is often talked about in my reality growing up and living here. I still live here. Um, is is often very different, and I don't lack the understanding that some people's experience is different than mine. But I do have the awareness that there are many stories that exist within community, and this broad brush narrative. Um, has painted um, a picture that has negatively impacted the community. Absolutely. I see it in the language of public health. And I'm not, a, I don't have a public health background, but very early in my tenure at RIA, was asked to sign on to a letter um, that was advocating for over the counter birth control. And the language in the letter as it was talking about um, women of color, um, women um, with lower educational attainment levels and um, young people, LGBTQ people, it was very negative framing. To a degree, I was like, that sounds a little eugenics-y. What if we, <laughs> like it was, and what I found out was that's a lot of the language of public health. And I was like, that's problematic because this leads to policy. Like, I'm, I know there are policies that are rooted in this 
type of framing, you know, talked about, um, I think it was unintended pregnancies um, due to lack of access to contraception led to, you know, burden on, it was, it was really shocking language. And, and I was like, no, 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 there are known systemic issues and barriers that are, you know, kind of leading to these things that you're talking about. These are, this is not the fault of individuals. Like it was, it was, it was very troubling language to your point. I cringed when I, when I read it and I said, we can't sign this. This is not good. (laughs) And I thought I would be risking the organization's reputation to sign it. And then I found out a number of people had all like, a lot of people had already signed on to it. And it just reminded me of the importance of narrative. Like we can't ignore, we can ignore that. It's not a soft issue. It's not um, something that um, we, we can't, we, we have to be intentional about it. And that was just a reminder because all I could see was like all the policy that has been, has emerged, right. Um, from just that type of framing, like who deserves and who doesn't. Right. Support and safety net. Who should we be managing through public policy and and practices, and who can manage themselves? Exactly, precisely. It was it was just all right there. Interesting experience, but it was just a it was an important reminder as I came into the to the space. Yeah, narrative is extremely important. Talk to me about Rio Ventures. What is Rio Ventures? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a social enterprise that leverages capital to advance reproductive maternal health equity. Uh, by centering the experiences and the voices of those who've been historically marginalized. Uh, so what that means is we think about um, uh, capital as a tool for innovation um, and for advancing equity um, and for advancing policy that's supportive of um, reproductive and maternal well-being, to maternal health well-being. So there is, through our work, uh, kind of four areas in which we operate. Um, one is venture investing. So through our subsidiary, RH Capital, we make uh, direct investments in early stage companies that are bringing innovation to the women's health market, um, specifically reproductive and maternal health innovation. Um, and so that work is done through a health equity lens. Um, we have framework and, and rubric uh, that makes sure that we're looking at companies and their ability to impact um, uh, disparities in outcomes and health outcomes uh, with respect to whatever issue they're they're seeking to to address. Um, we also uh, engage in call it corporate engagement, and shareholder advocacy. So again, leveraging capital um, and the power of public markets um, to address some of the challenges in the workplace with respect to HR policies and healthcare coverage, uh, that can be more supportive of reproductive and maternal health. So we, you know, we put out a few papers. We have the case for uh, the business case for uh, maternal health care and the uh, business case for reproductive health care and promote that, um, in, in terms of some of the policies and practices in companies and, uh, really large employers. We also engage in shareholder ad- advocacy, which is basically activism, shareholder. <laughs> um, uh, I'll use that word carefully. But <laughs> the uh, organizing investors to submit, um, a, you know, people who own shares of companies, publicly fair companies, to submit resolutions, proposals for, again, policies and practices that they believe as investors have a material impact on the bottom line. So through the, the lens of materiality, um, a company's HR policies or their insurance coverage um, can actually support retention. It can actually support um, better working conditions, et cetera. So kind of making the case for that. In a post Dobbs world, some of that has now shifted to um, looking at political spending in alignment with stated values. And right? so if a company's stated values are around gender equity and women's empowerment or racial equity, racial justice, then the political spending should support that to ensure that the company can achieve um, its mission and its bottom line. So kind of looking at that um, and seeking more disclosure around political spending, also around data privacy um, and and access, right? So public hospitals, for example, or publicly traded hospitals um, that are not necessarily disclosing to physicians uh, what their policy is or what information they would provide to law enforcement. So making sure that, you know, issues like that are 
um, are covered. A company um, that um, we wanted to make sure offered disclosures to customers regarding um, the information that would be provided if requested by law enforcement. So there are a number of ways that we can use um, the, the process of shareholder uh, activity to push the, the public markets in a particular way um, as well to make sure companies recognize that these are concerns for for their shareholders and, and that, again that they see that as a material issue and performance. So that's another body of work that we do also focus uh, on ecosystem building. So who are the different actors in the ecosystem? Investors, companies, nonprofits, and thinking about how do we help with uh, bringing a health, a health equity lens to, to the work that investors, companies, uh, nonprofits in the sector do as well. So offering frameworks, resources, a set of tools uh, that are available to the field with our website, um, trainings, access to um, all types of information that will help folks with that, that work in their um, organizations. And then finally, narrative change, right? So we do that <laughs> intentionally as well. I have a podcast, PS Blossom, that is uh, centering the voices of, the, of historically marginalized women and birthing people um, and creating their own solutions, right? Like, so part of our, our work is around just sort of learning about women's health issues, women's reproductive health concerns, like the whole spectrum from, you know, sex education and, and, and puberty all the way to, to menopause and everything in between. But what are the things, what does that look like um, through a health equity lens and through the lens of, um, again, historic marginalization? Like how does, how's your perspective um, on those, those issues uh, shaped? So, and, and what are some of the solutions people are developing as well? Um, so it's a pretty broad uh, set of conversations, um, but that is one of the ways that we're trying to start to shift the narrative also. Yeah. I noticed in your language, you're saying birthing people. Yeah. Why that language? Um, well, it recognizes certainly um, how people identify. It's a, you know, demonstrating respect and, and consideration for um, uh, of identity. Uh, so that's inclusive of trans men who can have children, who can birth children. So it's just um, a way of recognizing people who have uteruses. <laughs> right? So um, that's why we use the word women and birthing people. Love it. So The Real, you're the founder of The Real, which stands for, tell me. Racial, <laughs> the Racial Equity Asset Lab. And what led you down that path to, to founding that? And then what is that? Sure. Um, so... I founded that in 2018 after spending about seven years uh, while at AbbVie working on the Smart Investing Initiative, which was the, the fieldwide effort. It was the first effort that we knew of. I, I could be wrong, but it was the first one that we knew of that was looking at endowment management practices through a racial equity lens. So challenging foundations on aligning, again, their values, their stated values with their practices in all facets of their work, um, including the ways in which endowments were managed. So that took on the shape of manager diversity specifically, but then also we started to look into impact investing. Um, and so there's the who has opportunity to manage assets because um, less than one and a half percent of uh, assets under management, um, US-based assets under management, um, are in the hands of um, people of color and women-owned asset management firms. And that has everything to do with where people see opportunity and where capital flows. So it's important who manages manages assets. Um, so that was one aspect of it. And then the other was like how assets are being deployed. So what are the underlying strategies um, and approaches that are being supported as well? Um, and so when I left APFI, I went to work for the Baltimore Community Foundation for just under two years. Um, and when I left there, I had a conversation with a colleague who said, nobody's really moving this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to need you to do something. I was like, I'm not starting an organization. Um, and uh, at the time, he was uh, CEO of Common Future and offered uh, to fiscally sponsor the work. And so um, I launched the real as a social entrepreneur in residence with Common Future. And it really is just a venture that um, seeks to address the intersection of racial equity and impact investing um, in particular, but investment practices uh, in general. So um, I've created a set of tools, framework for decision-making 
um, but also looking to support communities of practice um, and just continuing to provide ongoing awareness and education and learning and even some translation between sort of, because I've, I've primarily worked with foundations, the translation between the grant making um, and the investment teams, right? Like they have objectives. So how do we kind of get them to work in partnership or to understand um, those those different perspectives and do some of the translation so that they can be able to work together. Have you seen any markable change from when you founded that? Yes. So now? I, I have actually. Um, what I'd love to be able to do is collect data on like the actual dollars, but um, there are more foundations that are paying attention to and then actually developing policy and practice and partnerships in a way that will result in a different set of actors at the table uh, making decisions and uh, where money is going. So between um, asset managers and increasing diversity among asset managers, I know a number of foundations um, that are moving the needle on that. Um, I'm starting to see more people actually reflect on their policies. Um, I got to say, in, in foundation and really institutional asset management, um, the investment policy statement is probably the most powerful policy I have ever seen, <laughs> I've ever encountered, uh, because it is the it truly is the document that everyone goes back to to understand what it is that they're supposed to do. Um, and so I'm actually starting to see some shifts and even being asked to, to look at policies um, to make sure that they're reflective of the intentions with respect to manager diversity or impact strategies. So I think there are folks who are taking it seriously and starting to uh, embed this in into their work and into the way that they operate. Are there enough? Nope. But there are more than when I started, right? So to have started this, in 2010 and now in 2023 to see the number of foundations and other types of, of investors, institutional investors or allocators, asset owners, take that seriously, take up policy, engage different uh, stakeholders, um, be more intentional with respect to how their, their impact strategies and or their, their general uh, decision making are reflective of those, those values is definitely a difference. Because when I started it, there was zero conversation at all. There was a lot of making the case for why this needed to be part of a process. And now I have conversations with foundations that are completely sold on it. They're really trying to figure out how do we how do we do this? And that's a very different conversation I have. Yeah, there's often tension. I think my pause and, and my smile was just listening over my time to people that live in the tension between the fundraising side of philanthropy and the impact grant making side of philanthropy. And in some places they operate almost as separate businesses under one roof. And mm -hmm. in other places they're way more interconnected and understand that it is all about racial equity work. Are you seeing also, I imagine that the answer is going to be the same, that the gaps between those, those sides of the business are becoming more closed as they're understanding that all of it is interrelated and all of it can advance equity. Are you seeing that? I'm still seeing the tension, a lot of the tension. Um, and I say that because um, I have worked in, worked with community foundations, for example, that, you know, have to manage donors. They have to raise money, right? Like they're, you know, establishing donor advised funds. They, they engage with donors deeply. I've worked in nonprofits as a fundraiser as well. Um, and the tension that I felt in some of the storytelling that I needed to do on proposals um, to meet someone's expectations of the, the disparity, right? Like the the doom and gloom and the blight and the disparity, which was like, wait a minute, <laughs> we have conversations about why we need to have this organization in the first place, right? Like, can we talk about the system that created that as opposed to blaming people for their behavior in these conditions that were intentionally situated? Um, but anyway, so I, I, I just think that's the one that still exists from where I sit. Um, now, other people may be navigating it. I'm seeing more uh, conversations about the fundraising um, and racial equity. It, it always felt like, well, that just, we can't touch the fundraising. Um, and then we also have, you know, sort of now there's a, a the community, community-centric fundraising um, and principles of community-centric fundraising. So now we're actually starting to see what it could look like, what a different approach 
and a different lens on fundraising could look like when you center equity. I think we have a very long way to go on that. <laughs> but the fact that that exists and the fact that there are more conversations, like that's how change happens is starting to raise awareness. Um, and again, with the narratives that we're starting to shift mindsets around some of this as well. So I think that's probably as big a gap as the one that I <laughs> was seeing around yeah. the, the investments. But folks are are definitely intentionally tackling it. Mm-hmm. And, and we touched on briefly just the racial reckoning of 2020. and. Mm-hmm. Thinking about that, right, and the organizations, foundations that are making sure that everyone in their community is thriving, that's a a common sort of mission to ensure everyone in the community is thriving, yet may not know how to tackle the issue that we just raised, right? Because if they're Mm -hmm. in leadership, not aware, in the staff, they're very aware of the tensions that exist on those two sides of the business. Would you offer any advice on how they might want to address, approach, or view? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's a great question. Um, I talk about the changes being, this is an adaptive challenge. This is not a technical problem. And to deal with an adaptive challenge, you have to understand that the solutions aren't clear and they're not necessarily known right like a training isn't going to fix an adaptive challenge and it's not going to be top down decision making that moves the needle on that type of challenge you have to be willing to hear from different voices and those voices are the ones that are closest to the problem you have to be willing to exist in some uncertainty which is which is a that's a challenge for, for leaders. And I say that as one because people want certainty, but this is not how organizations have practiced their work. It's not right. Like over time, how people have been trained to step into leadership, really. Right? Like, so we're asking people to um, operate in a way that's sort of contrary to everything that we've been told. <laughs> so Um, If we can at least recognize that those things are very real and they're legitimate, then maybe it creates the space for the conversation about what next to actually happen. And the we're we're going to have to exist in some measure of uncertainty. We're going to have to hear from people who we normally don't center in our in our conversations. Um, We're going to have to be willing to try some things right, and hold space for that. Like those are the the types of approaches, that, the things that people just need to understand. Because if you can at least understand that, like maybe you can position yourself to to enter into a, a an opportunity just a bit differently. I spent so much of my time explaining to people, decision makers on the investment teams, why the criteria that they use to source and to diligence managers was actually screening out black and brown managers. They were like, "Well, we don't see them. If they were performing, we would have seen them." It's like Tell me what your minimum AUM is. Tell me what your minimum track record is. And it's like you won't even see them. They won't even get through through your your initial screens. Structurally, it's not that they don't perform. You don't see them because of the structures that you put in place. Change those structures, and you'd be surprised at what you see come through. And I didn't even understand that again from a structural standpoint. So, a lot of this has been education. <laughs> a whole lot of it has been right, like having a conversation about redlining stripping Black communities of assets for generations um, or having a conversation about who's been allowed to work on Wall Street. I think all these things are why things are the way that they are and they've all been intentional. So yeah, learning is a whole big piece of it. So I guess where I'll go next is Voice Vision Value, Black Women Leading in Philanthropy. There are many of us in this space that have done remarkable work. You just named, you know, some incredible bodies of work and frameworks and tools that you've created, things that you have founded. Who are Black women in philanthropy for you? Collectively or individually? <laughs> I think I think both, like collectively both? and individually, yeah. Yeah. So I mean I'll say collectively, um like I had I and I've been out of philanthropy for a little bit, right? Like I consider myself philanthropy adjacent now because of the type of work that I do um, with foundations. But 
I mean, certainly collectively, it has been Black women that um, have really moved and have taught me how to move very strategically, um, how to leverage network, um, how to be patient um, in in a certain circumstance, right, like in space, um, and then also how to take chances. Mm-hmm. And so I would say collectively, most of what I've been able to get accomplished has been the result of Black women having faith in the, the things that I could do and telling me to go for it. Um, and so individually, that would include people like Susan Taylor Batten, who is the CEO of Abdi, who when I told her about this this work, I was like, hey, we could do something here. I was just like, okay, go do it. Um, and she's like, do your job, do what we want you for, but... Um, she really did back this this play, and she um, actually, you know, even if she, even if she didn't see the, my vision totally for it, um, she trusted me and really did encourage me to take leadership on the issue. Um, and you know, but I think with the recognition that that was that was Appy's leadership, um, and so uh, as an individual uh, to have someone support that type of work or um, that opportunity was actually pretty significant. I would say Toya, right? Like Toya Randall over there at Casey Family Programs, quietly changing things, changing the world, and her just unwavering belief in Black women. Um, and so Toya has been a friend and a mentor and an amazing support to me as an individual. And she just sort of moves in the world that way, not because she's picking and choosing people that she wants to um, see to are successful. Like that's just literally how she moves. And so if you encounter her, you're going to feel that energy and you're going to have that that immediate support, right? Like you're going to have either some kernel of knowledge that she has, some insight, some connection. Rarely met people who move so quickly on um, on being responsive, right? Like to to a need uh, when she sees it and figures it out. Like she, she really does. So um, she would be another uh, that I would certainly, certainly name. I mean, there's so many. Of them. <laughs> I don't even want to get in trouble for not me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel that. Do you think that our collective voices are loud enough, bold enough, heard enough within the field? No, no, no. But that's not because we're not loud or we're not bold, uh, or we don't seek to be heard. Um, I think it is. You know what it always is is you know we are like the the Cassandras is that is that the oracle that was the Greek mythology who was cursed with you know telling the truth but no one believed her like that was her curse right and so um, that's almost the you know to see it over and over again where we're lifting up the issues or the concerns or the insight and it's just not heard <laughs> it's just, you know kind of um, but when folks start moving in concert, right? right? Like those relationships and the networks and the what we what we get done behind the scenes, that's when things really also start to move as well. Um and I've always sort of recognized or I've always tried to be despite the fact that I was CEO, um, I've always felt like, you know what, I'd rather be number two because that's when I can get stuff done. Like when you're highly visible, people have all these expectations and there are all these different, you know, stakeholders that you got to respond to. Um, but when you are just under the radar, there's so much that you can get done. And I have seen people get things done, uh, resources uh, get out the door, people moved out of a, like one organization into another that was, you know, a toxic space um, into a much more supportive space, like all of these things that that happen because folks are like, okay, I, I see you, I got you, let's, let's make this happen. And so despite the fact that the field in general may not recognize um, and an honor what should be honored, it doesn't mean that we're not doing it. And I think we're absolutely doing it. And I just I love voice, vision, value because Toya was determined to put that on, she de- determined to put it on blast. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, for a field that has welcomed more diversity um, into the leadership ranks, it could be easy to think that by doing that, you're lifting up the voices. But there's a distinction between hiring and listening, yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, yes, all day. Absolutely. That Because I think sometimes can com- people can confuse 
diversity Mm -hmm. with power sharing, with sponsorship, with supporting, like all of those things that, you know, in this conversation, there's a sort of an examination of the policies, the practices, um, the being in the work that Mm -hmm. is sometimes distinctly different than the saying of what you're doing in the work. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. We know very often we know that. So you have to move very cautiously. Um, and sometimes may not be at the pace that others want you to be at. And the the question is, do I wanna do I wanna have deep change or do I wanna um do some performative work and and or do I wanna do transactional work? I wouldn't even say performative. I'll say transactional. And sometimes there are trans- sometimes that's just what you have, right? Like you can tee up something and get it done pretty quickly. Uh, but other times there is a far deeper strategy. Once you get into these roles to find out like, oh, the board, oh, the budget, oh, the leadership team, oh, the, you know, relationship to the community, right? Like there are all these things that get uncovered. Um, and then all of a sudden you're responsible for all of it. Unfortunately, you see this all the time where um, Black people and Black women in particular are put in um, positions of authority, um, power, power-ish, um, when there's disaster, right? Like when there's, there's imminent disaster. Like, so we usually end up taking over when there is either major um, operational or strategic changes that you know, or can in some cases be existential for, for an organization, but usually when there are these really big changes that need to, to be managed, um, uh, whether it's around culture, uh, again, operations, some type of market consideration in the private sector um, is when we are placed in the positions. And the, the work, the burden of what we have to do is far greater. So what people may expect of us in those moments, sometimes you just can't deliver on. It's just not even feasible to deliver on. And it just like, general let's keep this thing afloat never mind around you know equity concerns and considerations that you may want to be able to implement yeah what about the role of of governance and moving um change you sit on boards you certainly have a board you know i often get asked both from black folks that sit on boards but other folks white folks on boards that say i really want to work to advance equity on a board how can i leverage Mm -hmm. my voice to do that any suggestions? Um, <laughs> yeah. So the most important thing that boards do is provide an authorizing environment for the work to move. So nine times out of ten, the staff is like, "Okay, we know what we want to do," but there's this invisible barrier, <laughs> and it can very often be the board. Um, and so I think one ensuring that there's clarity that the leadership of an organization not only has permission, but there's an expectation that they are addressing equity within their organization, what that looks like. And so it can be, you know, the board starts with its own commitment and its own learning and its own data, right? Like not just in terms of sort of representation, but what, what's the dashboard data that we want to see on a regular basis to indicate what's happening in the organization with respect to equity, kind of working in partnership to, to do that. Um, it's the, what are our policies and our own practices that are as a board, right? Like how are we holding ourselves accountable as well? Because that's where that authorizing environment comes from, right? Like we expect you all as a team to do it. How do we do it? Is another area. And then when you're looking at the ways in which governance operates, again, what is the the intention for the strategic direction of the organization? Um, and so in that role, you have the opportunity to start to embed that, what happens next. So you can either set it to the side of it, like we're going to do a racial equity plan, whatever that is. <laughs> or you can say, we want to move our work through this lens uh, why going forward. That? Why? <laughs> I, and I, as somebody who does them, right? Like the I have done them. Like I have a whole boards right now. Let's do a <laughs> let's do a racial equity. You it's the so whole. I mean, it's the whole thing, really. It, no, it's not that they're not effective. It's um because they're very effective at spotlighting things that need to happen in the organization. The problem with it ultimately is, is like if it sits over here and not in the center of the organization and how it does its work then that in and of itself is telling a story about how you value it, right? So if you don't see 
racial equity as essential to your mission. And therefore, everything that you do, you're not necessarily going to carry it forward or do what's necessary to transform your organization so it's not operating through an equity lens. Um, and so racial equity only be centered in part of your organization and you can claim I mean I see it all the time <laughs> now right like you can't so right? like, no. you, you see it all the time right like for the program team that's the only team that's actually doing it so you know in a grant making organization that's who's doing it or in, you know nonprofits it's more like service delivery kind of thing um and that's not equity <laughs> that's that's this is not equity, right? Like, so if we're talking about equity, you have to think of all the ways that an organization operates, right? So as CEO, I have a view of this whole organization, the programming work that we do, the investment work that we do, um, our finance and operations, right? Like inclusive of HR, um, our role as an economic engine, right? Like we hire vendors, we hire consultants, our corporate engagement, shareholder advocacy, like all these things that we do. So literally all of those I have to understand through that lens. And it may look different, right? Like the way that it gets applied, um, but it still has to be there. And so, you know, to, to say we're an equity organization or we want to be an equity focused organization, but only for the programming, like then that's not your organization. Like, that's, you want to have an equity focused program. That's, that's not the same is being an equity focused organization. Um, so if you want to be that organization, that means you have to, like when I look out over all the things that I do and like my my landscape, it's got to be across the landscape and that's what a lens is, right? <laughs> like that's that's what that means is there is a, a particular set of assumptions, structural racism has normalized things to the point that we don't see them. And so you have to have a lens so that you're now seeing these things much more intentionally I'm trying to move to, to get to a different set of actions and, and outcomes. Well, that was a word. <laughs> In the beginning of the conversation, we were talking about the number of things that show up in our lives that we can say yes to. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine, uh, you know, many years ago, we're talking about a strategic no and a deliberate yes or something like that in that language, right? Where, you know, there are things that you just have to, figure out how to say no to because the work will keep coming. And so, you know, in this work as a woman of color, right, doing amazing things, I'm sure you are getting asked to sit and be at many, many things. Have you figured out your formula for your uh, strategic no? (laughs) I have not. (laughs) I'm still working on it. Um, It's should ask that that's something that I actually put out to my leadership team is to help me with strategic no's or strategic yeses and and no's. Um, and so kind of setting a, a, some criteria for when I say yes um, to, to some of these things so that I am definitely more present for, for the team, for myself, family, right? Like achieving um, greater balance in, in doing things. And so um, we're actually working on that together. So at least professionally, at least the things that come through the the reinvention inbox um, that I am starting to actually be much more strategic in the in the yes and the no's. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being on Centering Conversations and sharing a little bit of your work, your journey, the tools, the resources. If folks wanted to find some of the tools and resources, should they go to <laughs> Reaventures? Yeah, so you can find um, what we uh, have produced, our heart framework. It's a health equity framework um, at reaventures.org. That's R-H-I-A, ventures.org, um, under our ecosystem building. Um, there's a number of the reports that I mentioned also around um, uh, reproductive health care and maternal health care um, in the workplace are there as well. So lots of resources there. Um, and you can also, um, we'll, it'll be posted actually in the next two weeks, but you can gain access to the uh, Racial Equity Asset Lab framework um, through racialequityassetlab.org. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been Centering Conversations. This is Shonda Smith-Baker and Erica Seth-Davies. Thank you so much for having me. I genuinely enjoyed the conversation.
If you want to know more about Voice Vision Value, check us out at voicevisionvalue.org, where you can also read the Twin Cities chapter of the forthcoming book, Portraits of Us.